This is the channel where I have my personality on. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze. I am your boy with the blaze. My name is also Simon. Unfortunately, boy with the blaze is a meme that stuck. This script that we're going through today is written by Danny, as it always is. The memes later are added by, I had a coffee, by Sam. Some credit where it's due. Gotta get my coffee though. Ah! ETA was not in the video last time. People were upset. He is here. Honestly, <laughs> Honestly, I'm trying to work out a really good way to kill him off because I'm, I'm feeling like he's getting a little bit old that my co-host is a space heater, but everyone seems to love it. So uh, I don't know, maybe that's just me, but I can't imagine doing this show in two years and still being like, hey, ETA is probably gonna have an accident of some kind. You first, you clown. But I, I, I still need him in the winter. What's happening to, oh, by the way, this t-shirt that I'm wearing, the uh, smash the dislike button, this is a surprise hit. This is by far the most popular shirt right now. Even the allegedly t-shirts, which uh, I'm not gonna grab from my desk, but Sam, watcha. Uh, I thought that would be the most popular one, but this is the surprise hit. You can get this at uh, perchthemerch.co for Columbia. Yeah. Truly bizarre inventions, let's jump in. The problem with most pets is that they very rarely pull their weight and earn their keep. Although I've heard of some dogs that can help out with everyday household jobs such as laundry and truffle foraging, they seem to be the exception rather than the rule. I don't think dogs can help with laundry. <laughs> All I, I was walking down the street the other day and there's this dog just going absolutely nuts in the front of like someone's, I don't know, it's just an apartment building or whatever. And it's in there, it's in the grass and it's kicking up shit. It's going crazy. And I just walk past and this dog just absolutely jumps out of his garden and slams into my legs. And I give the, uh, <laughs> my automatic reaction is not to laugh. I'm such a dick that I just give the owner the deepest stinker. I'm like, what the f what the hell is even that? It's like, you're in a city. If your dog isn't behaving, put your fucking dog on a leash. Christ. And then I realized I was probably a bit harsh about it all. How this relates to laundry is uh, my, my trousers now then, then needed to be washed and I was on my way to work. That was great. I mean, fortunately, I work alone. I literally see no one ever. In my experience, most pets lounge about and expect to be waited on poor and poor. Uh, while you clean up their mess and spend a fortune on bills that they rack up. And this is why the hamster shredder is one of my favorite inventions of recent times, as it mashes up several problems at once and delivers one simple, ingenious solution. Don't panic! It doesn't involve putting your poor hamster through a shredder. I'm very kind to hamsters. We used to have one when I was a kid, and it lived to the ripe old age of four and a half. I have no idea if that's long for hamsters. I I'm pretty sure I had hamsters that they did definitely did not live that long. I'd like to think it's because me and my brother used to shove chunks of roast beef and Yorkshire pudding through the bars of the cage. Yeah, that's why he lived long, Danny. You fed him loads of unnecessary carbs that aren't part of his natural diet. That's why he lived long. No, the hamster shredder saves you the time and effort of lining the floor of your hamster cage with paper getting with paper by getting the hamster to do the work himself while simultaneously shredding your unwanted documents. In the meantime, your sensitive documents are just sitting in the, the, the in the hamster cage waiting to be shredded by a lazy ass hamster, which doesn't sound like security risk at all. There's a picture of it, uh, Sam. I believe Danny will have provided you with the images, so uh... A paper shredder is affixed to the top of the cage, and this is powering the hamster wheel. You just leave a bit of paper in the shredder, and whenever the hamster gets an urge to play in the wheel, this motion shreds the paper and creates a snowfall of fresh new bedding for your lucky hamster. I don't have a shredder. I just have a fireplace. And that's where I burn all my shit because I love the environment. Uh, at the moment, the hamster shredder is just a conceptual product, and I suppose there could be a few potential design flaws. For example, the hamster could be at risk of ingest ingesting the ink on the paper or getting a bit carried away on the wheel and suffocating in a cage overflowing with shredded documents. Seems a bit unlikely. More importantly, it could end up stealing your identity and going on a massive illegal shopping spree at Pet Planet. But a bum bum that bounced off my chair and came back. And remarkably stayed pretty 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 well together but i still applaud the creative thinking behind this product and would happily buy one russet myself tomorrow just in case i ever get another hamster this is exactly the kind of invention that the world needs right now all right danny now what the what the sort of invention that the world needs right now is a covid vaccine <laughs> but all right well, let's let's all focus on hamster shredding products danny let's save the world jesus christ danny 
Have you no social awareness? It's terrible. And sometimes it seems such a shame that many of the finest and brightest minds that ever lived were so determined to piss about wasting their lives inventing things that were often more bizarre than brilliant. So I asked Danny to make us a video, a script or a video about truly bizarre inventions, and he leads us off with the hamster paper shredder as the not in bizarre invention that we all need. This is gonna be good. The 50 caliber mousetrap, holy sh**. A 50 caliber is a hell of a bullet. I went to, I went to like a shooting range once and uh, I didn't shoot a 50 cal, but there was a guy there shooting a 50 cal and that thing, I, I, I just went, I was standing next to him. It's like a fucking train going past. That, thing's go, that thing goes off and it's like whoosh. Uh, sticking briefly to the subject of small lazy rodents, it never feels quite right to me. The hamsters get fed and watered and pampered and given access to an indoor gymnasium facility while their mice cousins are hunted and slaughtered in vicious traps. The traditional spring-loaded mousetrap was first patented in 1894 by William C. Hooker of Illinois. But this is not his story. Rewind, Illinois, I know, chill out. Rewind, just 12 years earlier. And a certain James A. Williams clearly had some long running feud on the go with the mice who were infesting his home in Fredonia, Texas. <laughs> Fredonia, creatively named by someone called Fred. He was determined to get rid of the filthy vermin once and for all, and he wasn't prepared to wait another 12 years for somebody else to get off their ass and invent the mousetrap. So he invented his own. And it wasn't mucking about. His clever invention was a spring-loaded revolver that would shoot the mouse right in its stupid face. Okay. James A. Williams claims that the invention was designed. There's a picture, Sam, thank you. Although this is like a landscape picture, so maybe just cover my, I, I don't know, get creative. <laughs> this isn't my goddamn job, Sam. Daddy, chill. James A. Williams claims that his invention was designed to be a new kind of trap by which animals that burrow into the grounds can be destroyed. Oh my God, dude, it's a bit intense. The idea was that a loaded 50 caliber revolver. Okay, uh, uh, maybe I'm wrong about what a 50 cal is. Because this picture, this is not a 50 caliber revolver. I'm pretty sure they can't make a 50 caliber revolver because the bullet's like this. It's like a big ass thing. This is not what I was thinking of. Or maybe it meant something different in the past. Look, there's going to be gun experts because this is YouTube and Americans watch and you've got more guns than people. So let me know. Whenever a wandering mouse steps onto the treadle of the trap, what the fuck is a treadle? A lever is released, which causes the rod to force back the trigger and blast the mouse to bits. This seems like massive overkill. Kill. An extra bonus feature is that the deafening noise of the six shooter going off in the middle of the night serves as a handy little notification thing for everyone in the household. Can you imagine just being asleep and it's like, BANG! Oh, fuck! This is the worst invention ever. Although, I I'm like, if I leave my phone, if I forget to turn my phone off when I go to bed and I get like a message in the middle, I like, ping, I'm like, ah! Oh, 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 thank God, this would scare the shit out of me. Also, what if someone's downstairs? Just like, oh, shit, I went through. Where's that bullet gonna go? It's not gonna stop with a mouse. Although William secured a pattern for his animal trap in 1882, it never really caught on. Even the traditional spring-loaded mousetrap that arrived on the scene 12 years later was a fiddly little invention at the best of times. One clumsy move and you could end up with a very sore finger. Oh, by the way, fun bonus fact, don't put cheese on a mousetrap. Apparently mice don't like cheese. Put chocolate on there. I think I made a Today I Found Out video about it. Even the tradition, also cheese is gonna go smelly really quick. Today I Found Out is another channel I do. If you don't know Today I Found Out and you know this channel, well, that's weird, because that channel's got like 2 million subscribers, but thank you, maybe check it out. If you're finding this a bit ridiculous, you'll love today I found out. <laughs> this is the channel where I have my personality on. Bearing that in mind, it's not too surprising that 19th century mousetrap haters weren't too keen on the idea of setting up a contraption in the house that could potentially blow your foot off if you accidentally trod on it. Perhaps most worryingly of all, Williams had even bigger plans for his mousetrap pistol, which thankfully never got off the ground. I almost skipped a page there. He reckons, that with a bit of tweaking and squeaking, but a bum bum tss, his invention could be modified to serve as an early version of the burglar alarm. What, by like a burglar stepping on this thing and having their foot shot off? I tell you what the bad news is. If the burglar comes in and they see this gun device, they'll be like, all right, well, I'm gonna take the gun. <laughs> and carry on with my robbery now that I'm armed. Thank you very much, homeowner. In a patent application for his animal trap, Williams claimed that this invention may also be used in connection with a door or window so as to kill any person or thing opening the door or window to which it is attached. Holy shit, dude, that's gonna be like some murder or some shit. I suspect this is around the same time that the Williams resident stopped getting any visitors. Can you imagine you just come home and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, I forgot to undo the gun trap and I killed my son. <laughs> uh, the Toma 
Thomas Tan something, who cares? I don't know about you, but whenever I'm running a long distance marathon, I usually find myself wishing that there was some way I could shove a nice juicy tomato in my mouth without having to stop or use my hands. Tell you what, Danny, that's just you. I ran a, I ran a half marathon once, and it wasn't actually that bad, but I had no desire for tomatoes halfway through. I'd long given up on this seemingly impossible dream, but then in 2015, along came the Tomatan, and it changed my world forever. Developed in Japan, the Tomatan is a wearable humanoid robot, right? With a cute tomato-shaped head who sits on your shoulders like a backpack. What the f is going on? When you're out and about, you suddenly feel, and you suddenly feel gripped by that un, by that regular unquenchable urge to eat a tomato, you simply pull a little lever on one of the robot's dangling feet that are on your chest. The Tomaton's circular robot arms will then retrieve a tomato from its own little dispenser tube attached to the back, and then kindly bring it back down to the front of your mouth, keeping a tight and sturdy grip on the controversially fruity vegetable as you take a welcome bite. This, what the f is going on? Did we say this was from Japan? Because I can believe this would be in Japan. They have vending machines with used underwear. Well, also, why is everyone obsessed with Japan? Japan is so hot on the internet. It's always like, oh, manga, oh, anime, oh, hentai. Like, really? Why would you do all that? Because it's cool. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Now, I realize that the invention of the Tomatan, Tom Tomatan possibly raises a few important questions. The biggest question might be, why, for the love of God, why? Yes, Danny. Well, it's only about half as silly as it may first appear. The design of the robot is a collaboration between Japanese food manufacturer Kagome and an artistic studio known as Maiwadenki. The latter already had a reputation for coming up with slightly wacky inventions, while the former just happens to be the biggest supplier of tomatoes and ketchup in Japan. What a shocker. But it turns out that tomatoes are a genuinely popular option for runners participating in the Tokyo Marathon, as they are packed with nutrition which fights against fatigue. So it seems as if the tomaton is an expensive and long-winded and overdeveloped way of helping these healthy runners get a taste of tomato without ever having to slow down the pace. Well, yeah, and it's also like totally fine. Just like, you're in a marathon, if you want to eat a fucking tomato great there'll be a stand just grab the tomato and eat it it's not complicated like there's water stands and juice stands just you it, it's not hard they also you got to carry around this fucking tomato something who wants to do that you're running a goddamn marathon they often say that the best inventions are ingeniously simple and this isn't one of them the real problem with the tomaton is that it's so heavy yes it's great that you're getting served the gift of tomato without ever having to slow down but you'll be buckling under the strain of carrying an extra 18 pounds of kit on your shoulders for the duration of an entire marathon Hey Siri, what's 18 pounds in kilograms? Fucking hell. Just guess. I'm gonna say four. That's a lot. And it can only carry a maximum of six tomatoes, which seems a bit feeble for the long distance runner. And while we're nitpicking, the Tomatun is a, has a robot mouth that opens and closes for absolutely no discernible reason, when this could clearly be utilized as an additional ketchup dispenser or something. I suppose this device could still be useful if it's not restricted to just tomatoes. I wouldn't mind seeing if it could squeeze some scotch eggs in there. Mm, scotch eggs are fine. I recently learned that these are quite a British thing. It's like an egg wrapped in meat with, I think, like breadcrumbs or something on the outside. It's like got egg and meat in it all the time. It's glorious. On my daily arduous dog walks, I could be munching away on six scotch eggs while keeping one hand free for the dog lead and the other hand free for a glass of red wine. You legend, Danny. Back in the year 1819, the British Navy organized an epic Canadian Arctic expedition, which was to end in disaster. Doesn't sound so epic then, does it? It's like, yeah, I went for an epic run. I died. <laughs> the copper mine expedition led by a lieutenant which is how I pronounce it when we're talking about British people, because that's how we say it in Britain. I think I told this story before, but I was in the cadets at school, like, you know, where, you know, you pretend to be in the military or whatever. I was in the Navy cadets, and the head of our section, the, like, teacher, who was the, you know, the, the lieutenant, and I watched so much Star Trek that I always could be, like, lieutenant. And I'd be like, it's Lieutenant Simon. I'd be like, yeah, I know. And I finally got it screwed into my head, only to become a YouTuber, and then get sh from every American for pronouncing Lieutenant Lieutenant. It's like, you just can't f***ing win. But the Copper Mine expedition led by Lieutenant John Franklin was a noble attempt to explore and map the Northwest Passage for the first time. Sadly, during the course of three long years, the Brave team was forced to abandon their plans after facing a string of unexpected challenges which sent them to the brink of starvation. I feel like if you're going on an expedition to explore somewhere really cold to discover something, are there really any unexpected challenges? It would be like, oh yeah, we came across like 
a cannibal tribe who decided to eat us. I would I would even say that that is not unexpected. I'd say that that is something you could reasonably expect to come across. Only nine of the 20 members of the group survived the ordeal and returned home. That's not bad, that's like just less than 50%. I mean, this is like exploration. Having been reduced to eating either lichen, their own boots, or the remains of rotting carcasses abandoned by the wolves. Jesus. Some of the team members that didn't make it home had been accused of murdering and eating each other. Uh-oh. A big part of the problem was that the group had become completely stranded on the wrong side of the Copper Mine River after all their wooden boats had been wrecked in a heavy storm. Oh no! Things! might have worked out very differently if only they'd just happened to have been wearing coats that folded out into boats. That sounds epic. I would love a coat that folds into a boat. I really want to get one of those, uh, you can buy them. It's like a kayak that fits into a backpack. You blow that shit up and you go kayaking. You get to wherever you're going and you can put the kayak back in the backpack and like hop on a bus back to where you start. And I'm like, this is amazing. I have to say, I always dream about doing these things. And then it's like, look, I run like eight YouTube channels. I pretty much work all the time. But I love to dream about hobbies. Have you ever had a dream that, that you, um, you had, you 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 could you do and this was the exact same thought that later inspired peter halkett to invent the coat boat in 1844. A Royal Navy officer and amateur inventor, Halkett had always been fascinated by tales of exploration off of the Canadian Arctic, and had become particularly interested in the story of the Copper Mine Expedition. Not so much the bits about eating rotten, tar rotten carcasses and murdering each other for the sake of a meat sandwich, Jesus Christ, Danny. Uh, but he was more interested in the thought of how an alternative, non-wooden, portable sailing vessel could potentially have saved the day. So Halkett put his mind to the problem of creating something that would be light enough to carry Carry around with you in the brutal wilderness, wilderness, while also having the capacity to double up as a sturdy and safe sailing vessel when crossing waters. This is incredible. There's got to be something that just didn't work out because otherwise everyone would just be walking around with portable boats all the time, right? Because it's awesome. Maybe the coat boat sounds a bit ridiculous. It sounds awesome, but it was actually a clever idea. Yes. A waterproof Macintosh coat had been handily invented a couple of decades earlier by Charles Macintosh. There you go. Also later the inventor of the Apple Macintosh. Not really. Peter Halkett's invention took advantage of Macintosh cloth that impregnated it with rubber to create nice practical winter coats that could be inflated into a boat in just under four minutes. When you were wearing the invention in coat mode, you had the option of a built-in walking stick and umbrella on your travels into the unknown. This sounds amazing! But when the invention had been transformed, in, transformed into boat mode, the walking stick became an oar and the umbrella became a sail. The coats, the coat compartments also included a paddle blade and small bellows. It looks like this. Thanks, Sam. The coats only weighed about seven pounds, less than half the weight of a silly wearable robot that can only dispense crap tomatoes, and inflated into a completely airtight and watertight vessel that could hold up to eight people. So the members of the Copper Mine Expedition would have only needed about three of those these coats between them. This is amazing! Halkett tested out his new design along the Thames River in 1844, and although he nearly got mowed down by several metropolitan streamers, steamers, the coat boat was judged a success as he sailed for 10 miles without any leaks or problems. For a brief time, at least, the Coatboat was a bit of a hit within the very within a very specialist circle of Arctic explorers, but it seemed to be destined to sink into obscurity after only a few years. How could it have failed to get the Navy interested in using his design, after which he had little luck in marketing his invention as an aid for fishing and duck shooting? But perhaps the best tribute to the coatboat came from one of the survivors of the Copper Mine expedition, John Richardson, who declared, Had we been possessed of such a contraption in our expedition, I have little doubt of our having brought the whole party in safely. We'll never know for sure. A more cynical member of the same group might have just said, you're gonna need a bigger coat. Next up, hit clips. This invention from 1999 must deserve some sort of credit for somehow becoming massively popular despite the fact that it was a huge leap backwards. I don't know, lots of shit comes out that's like retro and it's like, so it's just old and shit. Like, right? Like, why are people using typewriters? A friend of mine sent me a picture the other day of he was in a coffee shop and there's someone with a massive ass typewriter sat, sat like in front of him typing away. It's like, dude, do we have to? Hasbro's Tiger Electronics division originally released their slick micro audio systems, more commonly known as hit clips, through a McDonald's Happy Meal promotion. But the cutting edge technology proved to be such a massive success with kids that hit clips quickly made the transition to the main toy and electronic market. So what was the big deal? Well, as the full name suggests, this was a super tiny audio system. The hit clips digital player sold for about $20, while you could pick up micro music cartridges for about $4 each. That sounds pretty expensive. I mean, how much music is on there? I mean, the player's cheap, but 
Okay. The player was an absolutely flimsy little thing which boasted absolutely shite sound. It was about two inches long and came with a single headphone wire, so you could only listen to this ultra lo fi sound, lo -fi sound through one ear. It had no volume control whatsoever. In fact, it didn't have much else going apart from a single play button and a little clip so that it could be fastened to your clothing. Do you guys remember the iPad iPod Shuffle, which was like an iPod except you couldn't choose what you listened to, you just had to load on songs and just hope for the best that something came up next that you liked. You'd be like, I really want to listen to this one song. I never had one of these. I don't know why people bought these. There were regular iPods around that time which worked just fine. Oh, I like the excitement of getting something random. Really? If that's exciting for you, your life is not exciting enough. There was a vast library of music cartridges or clips available for the player, although you're never likely to find any Phil Collins or Motorhead. The range was exclusively devoted to music that was in the US playground at the turn of the millennium. Stuff like the Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Britney Spears, Avril Lavigne, and the Wurzels. I've heard of all of those except for the Wurzels. And I get the feeling I might be having a joke played on me by Danny. Why'd you have to go and make things so c Clips featured a colorful picture of the artist on the front, and when you weren't playing the clip in your player, you could attach that to your clothing too. I can see why kids love this. But here's the thing, each clip only played one minute of a song. That's a bit shite. So Four dollars? <laughs> So the, cunning name, so the cunning naming of the brand conveyed the message that you could just play a clip of a song, which you could also clip to your clothes. Great. Now it's worth remembering that this wasn't the dark ages. This was 1999. You could buy CD singles containing three or four whole songs for less than a price of a clip. You could play your songs on a CD Walkman in high quality through both ears instead of making do with tinny quality snippets of one song through one ear. Yeah, I mean, although to be honest, Danny, we live in a world where people buy records when you can get flak streaming services for, you know, the price of one and get all of the music that's super high quality in the world. Yeah, and all those people are a bit like smashing the dislike button right now, being like, the record quality is mwah, mwah, mwah. And I'm like, if you can tell the difference between 320 kilobits per second and record audio, I don't think you can. I mean, some people definitely can, but it's probably not you. You're probably just a hipster. And yet, hit clips proved to be a brief sensation in America, as Tiger Electronics sold over 20 million players, far hell, and generated about $80 million in revenue. Wait, weren't these things $20 million each? Uh, $20 each, so that would be like $400 million in revenue, not $80 million in revenue, maybe profit. Weird. And it was all about collect it was all about collectability and looking cool in the playground. You gained more street cred if you had a whole bunch of different colourful clips hanging from your jeans or keychains or backpacks or wearable tomato dispensing robots. But a bum bum shh. The Beatles could have saved themselves an enormous amount of time and effort if they'd realized that this was all it took to be popular, as they'd have only ever had to write 60 second songs. As the years rolled by, you could pimp your player with even cooler new add-ons such as an FM radio scanner attachment and a three inch boombox so that everyone else in the playground could enjoy a short muted blast of Britney. Oh my god, this is the worst thing about phones. Like people who insist on listening to music in public places. If you've ever done this, I don't like you. Also, this is my, I, this must have just been an American thing, because I was a kid in the playground in the year 2000. People would have had this if it was a thing, for sure. But they didn't, so it's America. But in two, by, by 2004, the game was up and hit clips disappeared into the history books. Although bearing in mind that vinyl had made a comeback against all odds, there's still a possibility for a hit clips revival. I want this. Maybe I can buy one off eBay. There, I think there's still a valuable lesson to be learned here for any budding business plays inventors out there. Instead of trying to come up with a radical new breakthrough that improves on existing products, just come up with something really crap that you can attach to your belt buckle. Good advice, Danny. And because of business play stimulating your thought process, just uh, send me a check when it's madly successful. And I might give some to Danny, or I'll just give him a little extra food that day. Because for those of you who are new, Danny is of course locked up in my basement. Chicken eyeglasses. Finally, here's a bizarre but largely forgotten invention that may seem like a wacky idea, but it's actually a shame in so many ways that it's mysteriously disappeared. Some might question the logic of chicken eyeglasses. Yes, they might, if they knew what they were. First developed and patented by Tennessee farmer Andrew Jackson Jr. in 1903. It's not like chickens tend to do much bedtime reading or have the need to make out road signs. Oh, so these are eyeglasses for chickens. But although chicken eyeglasses are indeed a special, uh, special spectacles for chicken, they aren't spectacles designed to improve sight. I think I might know about these. I think they're red tinted so the chickens can't see blood on other chickens and then attack them. I thought these were actually a thing. They're actually like small safety goggles 
claws, which are originally designed to help chickens from getting their eyes poked out by other chickens during those inevitable moments when the pecking order gets established. Ah, okay. As the years went by, new roast interventions were developed, which were meant to reduce the risk of aggressive behavior in the actual chicken as they disguised the color of blood on other chickens and stopped the wearer from getting aroused into battle. I told you! During the early 1900s, these stylish chicken goggles were exclusively available in America from the legendary Sears mail order catalog about 90 years before Sears took the foolish decision to ignore the internet and throw their own business down the toilet. Just made a video about that at Corporate Darwin Awards Part 2. Check it out. If you want to, you don't have to. I mean, honestly, if you're watching at this point in your video, you're probably like, fuck, I'm sick of this motherfucker. I just want to watch something else where he just reads me the script. But the glasses proved to be surprisingly successful and went on to shift big units throughout the course of the 20th century. As late as 1973, farmers in Illinois were snapping up thousands and thousands of these chicken shades. And at one point, there was even a campaign in Kansas for legislation that would require all farmers in the state to fit their chicken with the eyewear. That campaign was probably run by the same people who made them. But sad, allegedly. But sadly, they now seem to be a thing of the fast past. Many farmers now prefer to prevent the pecking problem by the method of just trimming off about a third of the beak with a cold or heated blade. Yeah, which is fing brutal. Stop that shit. This may cause more trauma, pain, and long term damage to the chickens, but I guess it's cheaper, easier and probably more effective than kitting out the entire flock with spectacles. From the perspective of the poor chickens, though, this seems a little short-sighted, but a bum bum This has been Business Blaze. I have been your boy with the blaze. This is the Smash the Dislike t-shirt, which you can buy at perchthemerch.co. Thank you, ETA, for the promotion. Mwah! And I'll see you next time. It's like, you just can't f***ing win.